The financial needs of a business go beyond tax and attest services. That's why CTBK goes beyond accounting services and offers outsourced solutions through their affiliation with CFO Solutions Plus. These additional services allow clients to focus on their operational and long-term strategic goals. Trust CTBK's outsourced solutions to provide cost-effective, value-added financial services tailored to your company's needs. Call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400. Or go to ctbk.com to learn more about CTBK's outsourced solutions. Welcome to another edition of Tim Graham and Friends brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and business consultants. I'm Tim Graham of The Athletic here with Jonah Bronstein of the New Bronstein Times, a conglomeration of uh, many news media entities most recently acquired by WIVB Channel 4, where our guest is the sports director, Josh Reed. Thanks for joining us. Tim, I have always, I've always loved the name of your... Uh your podcast. I love it. Tim Graham and friends. I was shocked that there was an S at the end of it. I'm not gonna lie. At the beginning, the first time I saw it, I was like, oh, that's, that's nice. He's giving him a lot, give himself a lot of credit with friends. So it, right. I thought, maybe it'd be friend, Tim Graham and friend. Tim Graham and but, friend, which would be Jonah, who I pay uh, to be on the podcast. So my paid friend, you know, Jonah came up with that name and it's really not the Tim Graham and friends. I think it was reverse engineered Open for uh, Jonah came up with the TGAF, which is yeah. you know, which I love. Like which I, also, I like I love fits. the double meaning of it and everything. I think it's all I do. I think it's a yeah, I think it's a I think it's a cool name. And, and it, it very much kind of grips who you are. And I like, I think that's I think that's the best part about it. That is a name that really encapsulates kind of surrounds who Tim Graham is. I love I love the name of it. And if anybody knows how to grip who I am, it's me. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody's this done it more. It only took 60 seconds for us to get derailed. <laughs> nobody, nobody knows how to do it better than me. Uh, we have a lot to talk about, Josh. I don't know where you want to start. Uh, we're going to be joined later in the podcast by Florina Altschiller. She's uh, the local attorney, used to be the uh, sex crimes prosecutor for the state of Alaska, now working with uh, Russo and Gold. We're going to talk about the Matariza case. Uh, but um, I don't know if we let's start with do we want to start with the Bills or do we want to start with Tage Thompson scoring five goals for a team that is really fun to watch, probably for the first time since you took over as Channel 4 sports director? Um, the Sabres have not been fun to cover at all. And especially through the Kruger times, but now look at this. It's a bit of a renaissance. Well, I guess let, let's start there, Josh. What, what are your, your thoughts on the Sabres being a thing and finally getting to experience what that means to the fan base? Yeah. I, you know, I've been here um, seven and a half years now, so you're right. right. I haven't seen a smidge of success when it comes to the Sabres. So this is definitely something that's refreshing. Um, kind of give you a little bit of an idea. Um, I, typically, if I'm out and about and somebody says, oh, you know, you're the sports guy, it's almost immediately, what do you think about Josh Allen? What do you think about, you know, it's, it's almost immediately bills. I was out two days ago, just happened to be picking up something at a store and somebody said, hey, how about the Sabres? And I honestly, I don't remember anybody ever saying how about the Sabres. And they, and the, their point was, and it wasn't, uh, you know, maybe once, maybe a couple of years ago about Eichel, right? If it was the Eichel falling out type of stuff, but this was genuine interest and excitement and man, they're really fun to watch. And they got a lot of young guys and, and, and I agree. It's, it's, I don't know that, I think for the first time I find myself wanting to watch them when I'm not working. And that's new because especially this late in the year, and it's not that late in the year. Typically this is late in the year for the Sabres where you're already like, <laughs> well, that was a fun ride. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it's man, Tage Thompson's ridiculous. And, and not only 
are they fun to watch? They're just so young. And I mean, ridiculously young. I mean, the young 20s, you know, guys that are like 21, 22, 20. And you're like, oh, my God, there's not only is there a chance that these guys become good together, but that they're good for a decade together. You can see uh, it in their faces. And I don't mean like the, the, like uh, in a spiritual sense or like that you can see it in their faces, like Sean McDermott talking about the look in a guy's eye. I'm talking about their actual faces. They are that you, you look at them and say, these guys are going to get bigger. They're going to get stronger. These are kids. Um, Closer in age to Brady. (laughs) You're right. (laughs) Tom Brady today. You're right. They keep getting younger. It's Benjamin Button. Um, but Dylan what, I Cousins guess, is one of those guys you're talking about. Like I look at Dylan Cousins yeah. and I'm like, well, he's 11 years old, and that's that <laughs> makes sense. That makes sense that he had two goals tonight. <laughs> you, you can see these interviews of some of these guys, and you're like, I mean, how has Jeff Skinner played in the league? What nine years? So you're like, well, that may. I mean, he's 17 years old, so he started when he was eight. <laughs> that doesn't make sense at all. That can't be right. It's got to be against some child labor law somewhere. But yeah, they, they do. They they look young. Like even just you look at them and you go, man, I feel like, and of course me getting older doesn't help that equation just across the board. When you took the job, Josh, to come to Buffalo, you probably had an idea of, all right, I'm going to an NFL town, but also an NHL town. That dynamic, you probably had a thought of, you know, when you took, oh, I think we just lost Josh. Oh. He was swiping there on his phone. I think maybe he was actually maybe trying to clean his swipe or something. I saw him reach towards the phone, and then I think he, yeah. So we're gonna have to join he him. What I, on Tinder while doing this? <laughs> I guess shouldn't say that. Um. So did you watch uh, the game last night while we're waiting for Josh maybe to come back? Did you get a chance to watch the Sabres game the first period? Which I watched the whole thing. I, I'm actually okay. working on a Sabres story. I was out at the arena this week. And as part of the story, I included parts of the game last night. So I was watching closely. I was taking notes as though I were covering it. And uh, um, we're getting uh, a lot of services. I'm not sure how the breakdown was. Weren't able to watch that first period on TNT. Oh, right. I think it was a spectrum thing. Uh, I have direct TV, so I was able to watch it. Um, Josh, we lost you there. Uh, Jonah was wondering if you were trying to Tinder while also uh, no. talking with this. Are you multitasking? No. Then I, I, I regret saying that. I regret well, saying before that. we started this, I made fun of Jerry Sullivan for figuring out how to do how to do this whole thing, and of course, then I f- found a way to uh, to foul it up. I, I got a phone call in the middle of Zoom. I don't know that I've ever received a phone call. And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, no, no, ignore that. And then clearly I hit the wrong We'll, send you, we'll wrap this up quickly and send you on your way if you need to no, get going. Okay. Absolutely not. I don't know. I don't know why that happened, but I know where you were. You, yeah, you were I was gonna... asking about just the idea of coming to an NHL market. Mm-hmm. You probably had a preconceived notion of, and you were probably told during the interview process about what a crazy hockey town this is. Mm-hmm. And then what was your, what was the reality once you got here? And did you feel like you were sold a bill of goods? Got a great story for you. Uh, um, I, I had probably had been living here maybe, maybe two weeks, maybe two weeks. Um, And in that two weeks, you know, it's like any job you get there, you hit the ground running and. You don't come up for air. And I think I had one day off in the first two weeks. You know, we were kind of short staffed and it was what it was. And it started the Bills season and blah, blah, blah. So we're at a day off and I had an afternoon. And I'm like, you know, I'm going to grab lunch. I'm going to have a pint of beer at the local, you know, Irish pub. So I'm sitting in there and it's the afternoon on a weekday. You know, I take a weekday off because it's Bills season. So you don't get weekends off. So I'm sitting there watching whatever's on the TV and there are two guys who come in and sit down and they're probably mid sixties, late sixties. And they sit down a couple seats down and I can hear them talking about sports. And I noticed that the one guy's got on Sabres, something Sabres, maybe a hat or a shirt. The other guys had, had some bill stuff on and I can hear, just hear them talking about just in general and stuff. And, and I'm like, you know what? I'm going to introduce myself. You know, I'm the new guy here and I'm not too proud to kind of introduce myself. And so I, I do. And I start talking to him. And after maybe 10 or 15 minutes, I said, 
what what would be bigger in Buffalo? Because I've heard how big of a hockey town this is. I said, what would be bigger, a Super Bowl or a Stanley Cup? And I was shocked that there was pause because when you grow up in Northeast Ohio, there's, I mean, there's the Cleveland Browns and then there's, you know, then there's the Guardians or, you know, as we grew up, the Indians, and then there's the Cavs. You know, the Cavs are a fun story and everything because LeBron, but let's face it, if that town ever won a Super Bowl with the Cleveland Browns, it would just be different. I was the probably in my paused, mid to late teens before I even knew what a Stanley Cup was in Cleveland. Yeah, right. We didn't yeah. have, we just didn't have it. We, we didn't, didn't care. It. it wasn't even on the news. It didn't even register. You know, Casey Coleman on Channel 8 was not giving us the hockey score, the scores, let alone the highlights. Yeah. John yeah. Telich was not telling us anything about the uh, the Minnesota North Stars. Yeah. And, the, and Columbus Blue Jackets didn't even exist then. Like they no. weren't even, a, they weren't even a thing. So the fact that they even paused now, they did both end up saying Super Bowl. I'm not going to sit here and tell you they said the Stanley Cup. But the fact that they, uh, like I said, this has been over seven years ago now. And I'll never forget that, just that little conversation and the fact that they paused. And then said, and I'm like, oh, the, it's, it is that big here, huh? And they're like, oh, it's huge. They're like, if they get good, you're going to you're going to see how much this city really embraces hockey and is just over the moon about it. And you can, you're starting to feel that bubble a little bit under the surface now with, with these yeah. young guys. And I can't wait to go to the arena and actually have it loud and, and packed and enthusiastic and what we see at the bills game every Sunday, you know, we see that it almost to the point where I wouldn't I don't know if we take it for granted because we're focused on doing our jobs, but it's just kind of commonplace. We just, it's Sunday. We know that they're going to be there. We know they're going to be loud. It is, but it'll be cool to go to a Sabres game on a nightly basis and just have it be crazy in there. So, uh, yeah. Let me, let me uh, jump, uh, use your, uh, quite your story as a springboard here for everybody to answer. Um, you've lived here long enough. You, you, you can answer this uh, very authoritatively. All right. So the answer is a Lombardi trophy. The, the Bills fan, or Buffalo sports fans would want to win a Lombardi trophy over a Stanley Cup. However, what would be bigger? OK, the Sabres win a Stanley Cup first. Let's just say that that has happened. That is the first championship, just like us in Cleveland. It's the Cavs. Yes, the Indians won and the Browns won their NFL titles, all that stuff. But it's almost, you know, the Cavs have won their championship before, you know, the, the Cavs have won or before the Indians and, and the Browns have won a Super Bowl, all that stuff. But then what is bigger, the initial championship that Buffalo gets or if or the Lombardi trophy that comes after? You asking me or you asking Josh? Both. Go ahead, Jonah. I'll let you, you take it first. I'm going to marinate on it for a second. Yeah, well, am, am I, is, from, am I'm I, from Western New York. I can. I think I can answer this question from that perspective. The Bills Super Bowl would be bigger because, I mean, the Bills franchise goes back further than the Sabres, and it's the NFL, and it's, it is, I think, a football town more than a hockey town. But you get the gist of my question, right? Hockey. The yeah, initial, yeah. just Buffalo no longer being a championshipless town. Yeah. I, I think and that breaking through and winning a title. Yeah, the first I think the first championship would be a slightly bigger deal because it would break this curse and would break this belief that Buffalo can't win and that you get to the, you know, the no goal or the wide right situation and it all falls apart. So, yeah, that first championship, I think, would be maybe not a bigger deal, but an equal deal to the potential Super Bowl champion that should come after. And I've always thought that the parade that could happen in June after the Stanley Cup will be a bigger event than the parade that happens in the middle of a lake effect snow event in February when the bills win. So, I mean, I think the bills winning is a bigger deal because it's the bills, but that first championship will be a more memorable experience or an equally memorable experience. I think. Well, the, let the me bills layer bills another, be a bigger, sorry, let me layer another element on it for, for, uh, for Josh's answer too. which would be the bigger party. And you mentioned, uh, you just set it up there because of the time of year it's warmer it's spring. People have cabin fever around here. You've gone through the madness of going through series. You'd have to go through four series of potentially seven games, the euphoria, as opposed to the NFL having that bang, bang, 
you know, just once a week, once a week. One, all right. You get there and yes, there's a euphoria, but there is a almost a lifestyle. There is a playoff lifestyle for a fan of getting through the hockey tournament, um, which would be the bigger. So maybe if you want to factor that into your answer, Josh, which would be the bigger party, Stanley oh, Cup or Lombardi Trophy? I, to, to Jonah's point, the time of the year is a big factor in it. I was in Cleveland. I went for the parade, and it was unbelievable. We were together and, when the Cavs won it. You called your grandmother. Yeah, yeah I called yeah, my I grandmother. Let, you excused we, yourself from the bar to call your grandmother. Yeah, Nation State. yeah, it was it was awesome. Uh, I were you went there, back. Jonah? We're mm-hmm. we're all three of us together. Yep, yep, we were there. Okay, Kyrie Irving. Yeah. yeah, that was it, it. That was awesome. And I went back to Cleveland for the parade, and um, it was it was 115 degrees in the dead of summer, and it was awesome. It didn't matter. Like the weather didn't matter, and that's why I don't think the weather would be would be a huge factor. I'm talking people are passing out from dehydration. And I just think that, you know, Buffalo people, it's, I, I say, I'll say a factor that needs to be talked about a little bit is the NFL is just always going to be a bigger story nationally. You know what I mean? It will put, it, it would put Buffalo on that national stage and pedestal of here's a champion city here's a city with a championship team sure the nhl will get that but the super bowl it'll be a month's worth of people that's talking. that's a great point that's a great point i think that there are fan bases in other markets that would say oh that's cute you got your hockey title um that get back to us when you win one of the bigger three it's a, yeah it's in the big four but there it would almost be like an inferiority complex type thing you're right yeah, we that's, finally that's got one there is an inferiority complex. What's that? Into that? Well, I was going to say there is an inferiority complex that plays into that, and it's a little bit flipped with the hockey fan base because there's somewhat of a superiority element to thinking that this is hockey heaven or maybe this should be Hockey Town USA instead of Minneapolis, and that I think a lot Detroit. of hockey fans feel. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, right, right. There was a Sports Illustrated article that said Minnesota should be the new hockey town, but anyways. There's a belief that Buffalo should be Hockey Town USA and that Buffalo deserves a Stanley Cup and a, a team that contends for the Stanley Cup and wins it over and over again and a hockey dynasty that with the football fan base is a bit more of, you know, these lovable losers and pinch me, I can't believe this team is Super Bowl caliber, which is also, I think, why maybe it would be a bigger deal. As Josh mentioned, it's a bigger deal nationally. It would affirm Buffalo's major sports status more so if they won the Super Bowl. And the history of losing the Super Bowls and the history of the Bills franchise plays into that a bit more. And I think if you, most people, a lot of people are fans of both teams. But if you were to poll everybody, there's more football fans that don't care about the Sabres than there are hockey fans that don't care about the Bills. So the fan base is bigger for the Buffalo Bills, and it would be a bigger deal. But that first championship, if it happens first, I think is maybe the bigger West New York Buffalo sporting moment or equal if it happens first. All right, the whole sentiment of pinch me, I can't believe the Bills are Super Bowl caliber. Uh, a major reason for that uh, was lost uh, for this season and maybe the next. And I know Jonah has some feelings on whether uh, it's going to maybe impact a career. Um, but, and I wrote this for The Athletic when they wanted my hot take on Von Miller's absence. And to me, it's more of a spiritual loss because the Von Miller acquisition played a significant role from my standpoint of thinking, oh my God, you know, somebody wants to come to Buffalo. That Siberian stigma is maybe gone. People are coming here to chase championships, uh, right? Burn it all, the whole thing. Von Miller did something to this fan base to help them believe as great as Josh Allen was and Gabe Davis scoring four touchdowns and all the excitement over every player that, you know, but it was Von Miller that kind of galvanized this idea that, holy shit, this is happening. Uh, these guys are legit. Uh, and now you remove that. And it's one of those kicks in the nuts of damn it. This is what happens to us. Um, now I don't know that he is that monumental of a hurdle to overcome. I think that the, uh, I think that the, uh, the younger pass rushers have come along a little bit. I think they're, it's a loss. 
But anyways, I guess that's my my way of just kind of going from that whole uh, belief and there's this uh, now a mystique about the Bills being good and all things are possible to getting knocked down a peg or two this week. Uh, Josh, what was your your take on the Von Miller injury and, and how significant it is? Or maybe it's being played up too much. I don't know. Now to, to go back a little bit real quick first to, to your point, like when they when they land Von Miller, you know, it, small market Buffalo, you know, I grew up in small market as a small market Cleveland fan. It was a superstar who, wait, he loves us as much as we love him. Like, it's crazy to, to even think about that. Think that way. You just assume that the big name future Hall of Famers that are still really good would ever want to come play in the Buffaloes and the Clevelands of the, it wasn't that long ago that Anquan Bolden got a look under the hood and said, I'm sorry, I'm retired. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Peace. See you later. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, but um, I I don't, I I thought it was interesting yesterday. We had a chance to talk with, with general manager Brandon Bean after practice. Um, And one of the questions he was asked, and I I thought it was a good question. I mean, what, how's he really get his, the question was, is there enter any buyer's remorse, if you will? You know, you sign this guy to this humongous contract. It wasn't those exact words, but that was the gist of it was, you know, this guy gets this huge contract and he's over 30 years old and here he is with a knee. And, you know, obviously you didn't get the first full season out of him. And now you might be, you might not get him back until next Thanksgiving, you know, depending on the timeline number Brandon was like, no, you know, you know, he's been such a huge factor for the team on the field and in the locker room. Like you said, it was almost a spiritual kind of, you know, the impact you can tell that he's had on these guys. You have superstars like Stefan Diggs quoting Von Miller in a post game press conference, the whole don't blank thing. Like you just don't usually get, superstars quoting other superstars like and what what their kind of belief system is shows you how how he was kind of able to get in his teammates heads and kind of rewire their thinking almost um so i think it's a huge loss i think there's no replacing you know sean mcdermott we've heard him say next man up a thousand way more than he would have wanted to this season because the injuries just keep piling up there's no next man up for Von Miller. There's no, there's Boogie Basham is improved. And, you know, Greg Rousseau's got, I think, five sacks or four and a half sacks. And he's shown flashes. And, you know, Shaq Lawson has kind of resurrected his career coming back to Buffalo. And there's no, I mean, Von Miller is that guy in the. He hasn't quarter resurrected it that eight. much. No, I mean, but he's he's, shown he's like fact. he's resurrected it in a way that he's still in the league and getting and playing meaningful snaps. It, it's but, not as though he's uh, flipped the switch and he's back to you know second year Shaq Lawson out of Clemson. Um, yeah, this is going to have to be a by committee him, thing. I'm sorry. Go ahead, John. I, I think. I mean, it's. The Bills are probably glad he's on the roster and, and oh, it's, you know, sure. nice to have at this point in time because he was a bit of a luxury as the ninth or tenth defensive lineman that they kept, and now he's a key player. Yeah, and he's shown flashes. Like I'm not, he's not going to take over a game, but I think he's good for a man. I mean, I, sometimes I think the high motor things overrated, but you can tell that there are some guys that it actually holds true to, and I feel like they do kind of feed off of his his energy a little bit, um, but. The Von Miller thing, it, it almost gave, gave you the idea that the Bills now had a guy on each side of the ball that in the AFC championship game, if it comes down to the wire against the Chiefs, it didn't matter which side of the ball it was going to would be on the field, whether it was Von Miller in the defense or Josh Allen in the offense, 17 or 40 would make a play that would end the game. Like they just – the, those are the two guys that you went, okay, you know, that's the guy that's going to make the play. Um, and now you, you take one of those guys out and, and here we are. I mean, look, they were still 13 seconds away without Von Miller 
and beating, you know, and beating the Chiefs last year. Who knows if they get past that game, what what happens? Um, so I still think they have enough pieces. I don't think it's time to go, well, 2023, let's start looking ahead to that. I mean, I think there's plenty of pieces, but damn, this would be a good time for Josh Allen to get on a heater, right? And just put eight, 10 weeks together where you're like, wow, never mind. He is, but he should have been the MVP favorite the entire season. If, if you were to pick, I'll, I'll throw it to either one of you, having a healthy Von Miller or a healthy Tredavious White who makes a bigger impact for the Bills defense in the playoffs. Because mm. last year they didn't question. have White. They didn't have Von no Miller either. But, you know, would you make that swap? If you get all pro Tredavious White back in the playoffs, does that help them and make up for the fact that Von Miller won't be out there? What a great question. That is um, good. I think I think I would take a 100% healthy Tredavious White to be honest with you because I think the fall off from Tredavious to man I don't know now that I'm saying it out loud I'm like is the fall off greater from Tredavious to cornerback two my than answer from Miller my to- answer is Tredavious White because I don't think you can you can replace potentially I don't and I don't I'm not saying that it's that it's going to happen for Shaq Lawson. You can't replace a lockdown corner by committee. You can replace quarterback pressure by committee. You can scheme up some things. And yes, you can scheme up some things with help with a young corner. But I think that not having to worry about a third of the field, potentially, um, with blocking down the other team's best receiver. I think that the bills would be able to scheme up some pass rush with what they have much more so than the other way around. And Tredavious white doesn't come off the field. You know, we talk yeah. about it all, all the time about, you know, a rotation along the defensive line and the bills like to shuffle guys in and out. Well, Tredavious, when he's healthy, he doesn't leave the field. He's on the field every single play. So that, that, to me, is a factor as well. Who do we think worries Pat Mahomes and Andy Reid more, Von Miller or Tredavious White? Von Miller. Probably. Right? However. I think so. Yeah, that, that might be who worries them more. But I, I don't know how I, if I, how I can say this, um, how I can articulate this. But I think that they would be game planning – for not they would that that might worry them more so it's a question of semantics they might worry them more but i think they'd be more excited to not have to see tredavious white does that make sense because of what they would be able to exploit that's a great question man you that's should do this for a, a living question. jonah ask questions. i know jonah, what are, yeah that's well, a, it's, that's, it's also interesting a, too because whether it's white miller or really just anybody on the bill's defense it's all about that game against Kansas City, which, I mean, it has been in Kansas City the last couple of years. Maybe it's in Buffalo this year. But, like, this game against the Dolphins and, and this game against the Jets, it doesn't matter as much. It's, it's They needed Von Miller to win that game, and now they don't have him. They didn't have Tredavious White in that game last year and, and potentially should have him this year. Does that make a difference? And it really all comes down to one game against one opponent and, and stopping one quarterback, really. Yeah, they there's not a lot of overlap between Tredavious White and Von Miller. Uh, they they only played two games uh, together. Two like really five good quarters. Twenty five. No, yeah. not even that. Five, four. Uh, they played three three quarters together. One quarter in the one game where Tredavious White came back and played two series, and then Von Miller left the, the next game early. Yeah, so, he, Trey played fifteen snaps, and. I, I, I don't know this, but I'd be willing to guess that Vaughn was not on the field for all 15. Typically, right. he's he's not. So, yeah, I mean, what, what would your estimate be that they played 20 total snaps together over something like you that? Know, maybe. And Jonah, we were talking before the before we hit the record button. You may you're you're uh, skeptical as to whether we see elite Tredavious White and elite Von Miller ever together on the field at the same time. And the Bills fans have never seen them play together in a home game. And they will probably at some point, but it's going to be a long time before you get to see that. But your, your thoughts on, on Von Miller's career, Jonah, you were well, I, opening I, the door for you to speak here. 
I think that I think Von Miller is going to come back from this injury and play and, and probably be an effective NFL player again. But I think the Von Miller that the Bills signed and, and were hoping to get for the postseason and got a glimpse of through the first half of this season might never come back again, or it might get to a situation where, look, he's not going to play the rest of this year. He comes back as Josh said, it might be Thanksgiving by the time we see him on the field next year. And the way ACL injuries work, he, he might not be a hundred percent through that end of the season and playoff run. And then he turns 34 in March. He comes back the next season. He'll be 35. I know he says he wants to come back and be on the field next year, and he's going to play out this six year contract, but I'm highly skeptical that Von Miller, the explosion and the athlete that he is, will ever come back and, and be like that in a Bills uniform and the way the contract is structured. Like I thought when they signed him that they were signing a guy and they were going to get one good year out of him. And if they won the Super Bowl, it was all worth it. But as the years went along in that contract and the way the salary escalates and the salary cap and his age, that it would be a, to disagree with Brandon being a little bit, a little bit of buyer's remorse as they get years into the contract. And now the year that was supposed to be the one good year and make it all worth it, He's not going to be there for the playoffs and potentially the Super Bowl. And you might never see that impact player Von Miller in a postseason game for the Bills. He turns 34 in three months and uh, will be coming back from a reconstructive knee surgery. Um, and there's very few NFL pass rushers, especially speed rushers of his size and his game that have been good at age 34, 35. There's yep. a few, but very few of them. Yeah, I don't even know if before the injury there were many people that believed he would see the end of the contract, right? I mean, I, right, yeah. I even it's a before, three-year deal effectively. Yeah, that's that, then that's kind of what I I think they were hoping. Hey, if if they could get two of those three, one is a very productive, two is a productive, and three is a well, hopefully we won a Super Bowl yeah. by right. then. Three is you're looking at your ring process. and you're saying it was all worth it because I got this ring. It was, and, yeah. and, right? And, I mean, I think right. that's the case, you know. Even still, even if if they win the Super Bowl this year, I still there's probably still part of them that goes, who cares? Who cares how we spent the money? Right. right? And, I, and I think I, and I think I'm okay with that. Having, you know, having grown up as a Cleveland fan and seeing – all these teams that were supposed to be good and supposed to win and, and never did anything. I, I don't, yeah. Spend it however you want to spend it. If the trophy ends up back in Western New York, who cares? Who can I think I, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the Rams just being like yeah. <laughs> F the picks, right? right. Isn't that their <laughs> motto? Who cares? Look, they, I think I saw some, you guys may, may know the exact uh, nature of the stat and tell me if I'm correct on this, um, that the Rams have the worst record ever for a defending Super Bowl champion through like, whatever, what are we, week 14 now? I think I saw that somewhere. I was like, wow, but who cares? Like, who who cares? I mean, especially Rams fans. They don't care. They literally only care about whatever's hot in the moment. Like, they have all checked out on the Rams. They checked out on the Rams week four. Yeah, the, especially uh, – the number of guys, Sean McVay included, that you thought were maybe going to retire or take the year off after the Super Bowl, you kind of saw it coming that it was last year was the year and they weren't too worried about defending that title or coming back and being quite as good the next year. They, yeah, they, they went from winning the Lombardi Trophy to potentially having Baker Mayfield as their starting quarterback tonight. Oh, Baker! Um, but I'll say this, if the Bills do win the Super Bowl, Von Miller will have earned his Super Bowl ring because I think the imprint that he made on the team for all the things that we were talking about earlier, most notably uh, the point that Josh made about rewiring some of these guys and, and how to attack and, and get after it and to pursue a championship, uh, I think has been worth the money spent. Now, do well, you get and even in press conferences that some of the things he said, I think have instilled this team with some confidence that it was yeah. already a confident bunch, but he came here and said, this is a great team with great players and I'm adding to it. And I think the bills have fed off that and believe that they are a super team with or without Von Miller. And if they do win, you know, Von Miller is going to be out there on the sidelines with a headset on, he's going to be part of this team in the playoffs, even though he's not playing. And if they do win the championship, I think he'll get some credit for that. But if they don't, if they lose in Kansas city, I think you're going to look at, say, a lot of people are going to look at that lineup and think if Von Miller was out there, the Bills might have won that game. Quite the um, assistant coaches, Micah Hyde and Von Miller. Right? 
Yeah. <laughs> to have the coaching staff, I'm sure at times would look over and go, for real? I mean, what, what is happening? <laughs> really? We deserved this? Well, as Micah, Micah Hyde Hyde's told the... Uh, right? I yeah. Mean, dude, I'm telling you, he works out every day. He could we be back see, for the postseason. He told I'm Joe Biscalia last week that he's uh, he's know. trying. It was a great article. I read it, and he and you know when the initial injury happened, it was twenty three and twenty three, right? That was kind of the his number and the year number. And well, the calendar flips to twenty three for the Bengals game. Yeah, so that's true. Technically, it, it would be twenty three. That's true. I, it, Good point. He, I'm telling you, he works. He does not. He is not working out like a guy who isn't going to play a game for another eight months, nine months. It's just interesting to me. Uh, now, before, I don't know anything inside, but I think it's interesting. Well, before we let you go, Josh, I want to broach the subject of UB football. Channel Four is the official UB station. Um, I'll. I'll. I'll bring the topic to the floor in this way. Uh, they're going to Montgomery, Alabama to play a bowl game against Georgia Southern and their former quarterback, Kyle Van Tree. So uh, a success by that marker uh, in that you made it to a bowl game. Uh, and then last week, Mo Linguist, we learned was up for the Cincinnati job, which surprised me uh, because Quite frankly, I, I don't think that what he's done at UB, at least to me, has been earth shattering. Um, how successful of a season was this for UB? To whomever wants to answer, Jonah, you you cover the was, team. Okay, go ahead, go ahead, Jen. Who, who is a successful season? I think the bowl game is a big factor in that because they're a six and six team going to a bowl game. If they lose, they're six and seven. If they win, they're seven and six. Coming off a of four and eight season, so how many wins improvement and May, being bowl eligible is an accomplishment, but the way the season went when they were five and three and then they lost three games, it, it sort of seems like they backed into this bowl against an Akron team that had nothing to play for. And uh, UB shouldn't have had to come back and win that game in the last minute with the way that they did. Um, so, but I do think in the steps, if Mo Linguist is not leaving for a bigger job, which I don't think he is this year, but I think eventually he will. But this is a step towards them being a MAC championship contender in a better team in a better bowl game a year from now. But losing this bowl game would give them a losing record and not and going into the offseason off of a loss. So I think it's important to, to have that momentum of two straight wins to close out the season and not losing against the quarterback that you let walk out the door last year and didn't necessarily think he was good enough. And now if you lose against him, I think that's a little bit of a bad look. You, you, Jonah, you've, you've been around Mo more than I have during the season, but getting to know him. You know, quite a bit, you know, during the off season. It, it, the problem was when he got here, with, with COVID was kind of the thing. So you really didn't get a chance to see him face to face. But I tell you what, he is a motivator. I mean, that definitely is a guy that it's not surprising to me that you have some of these big time programs, Cincinnati, you know, being interested in him because if he gets, do you want, do you want to walk that back a little bit? The, the phrase big time program. Okay. You want to walk Since, that back I, a little bit. Uh, I know, but you, you that's know, that's a what good I mean. program it's now, though. Like, it's on the way up, but a yeah, larger it, program. I don't know about a big time program. Okay. Not a big time. It's not, yeah. Okay. You're, you're correct. I, I get what you're saying. They were in the playoffs last year. And I mean, and, and they're constantly in the top 25, I feel like. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, lately, I feel like they're, lately. yeah. I mean, oh, yeah, they're not Ohio State, but, there aren't many Ohio states. I think that's a, well, let's put it this way. If they're not a big time program, Tim, why are you surprised that he got an interview for it? Because usually <laughs> when these, when these coaches <laughs> climb the ladder and the mid American conference is one of the great stepping stones for, for college coaches, you at least have a, you don't have to be dominant. You don't have to have a run of mid American conference championships, but you at least need to have a, clear winning record right i mean you just usually don't see that well i i yeah. think that i i don't know i i think that um i it doesn't surprise me like like i don't know just getting to know him and the way that 
these college teams are being built anymore, right? Because they're, they're, that's how they're, they're being built from the transfer portal, right? It's like, it's, it's sure there's recruiting still, but it's, it's more about plucking these guys from the portal anymore. It really is. And it, are you, are you comfortable enough as a coach to go into, uh, you know, into a kid that's got an apartment already because he's 22 <laughs> you don't even go to mom and dad's anymore to sit down and recruit these guys he's 22 you can go to the bar and have a beer with him now and try to convince him to come to your school and be your quarterback i don't i don't know that mo linguist is doing that but he's a guy that i feel like can convince people that that he can be the guy to lead a team to the next level i I know I've that this is anecdotal. I've been disappointed in UB, though. I, I know I that know this is you. this is anecdotal, but it goes to your alma mater, uh, Josh, and where I also attended briefly. You know, Daryl Hazel was considered a fast rising star coach in the college level. He was the assistant head coach at Rutgers. Then he was the assistant head coach for six seasons at Ohio State. But he needed to go somewhere and prove that he could do it. So he goes to Kent State uh, as the head coach. And it took him to take, he gets the job at Purdue after taking Kent State to an 11 and three overall record, eight and 0 in the conference. Uh, and then it didn't work out for him at Purdue. He got ran out of there pretty quick. But, um, anyways, it was just like that's what you generally get when you make that mid American conference detour for that spring to like bounce off that trampoline and, and shoot to, um, and again, Cincinnati, I think it's probably, yes, it, it is a much, much, more decorated program. I'm thinking more of in terms of conference, you know, Cincinnati just doesn't have a lot of sexiness to it. Um, so yes, maybe uh, if, I, if we have any uh, Bearcat alums uh, listening to <laughs> Tim Graham and friends brought to you by CTBK, I'm sorry. Uh, I hope you didn't click off. Uh, but um, yeah, I, so anyway, that don't was kind of Bearcat my point. Bearcat Nation uh, fired up. Bearcat Nation <laughs> is don't mess with them. Don't that's poke right. the Bearcat. Rodney McKissick would be jumping my shit right now if he were still around. Uh, if, I, if I could jump in real quick, I just wanted to you know, respond to your question. You know, I, I would have been surprised if Bowling was gets the Cincinnati job. Because as you pointed out, usually, you know, a lot of Mac coaches move on to bigger jobs, but usually you got to win the Mac first. And you kind of got to establish yourself as somebody who built the best program in the Mac to move up a level. Lance Leipold. Lance Leipold needed to, you know, win the Mac. And actually, we didn't ever win the Mac, but had the best team in the Mac a couple of years. A lopsided win-loss record. Yes. And you can even look at Kent State's current coach, Sean Lewis, who's been mentioned as somebody who's on the way up, but they haven't really broken through and won the conference yet. And I think that's something that for a lot of these coaches, you kind of have to win, you know, dominate your own yard before you move on to the bigger yard. But I'm not at all surprised that, Mo Linguis is in the mix. He will end up leaving UB for a bigger job at some point. He probably will get this team into a championship position and then make that move, but he might even make that move before. If you look at his resume, he's, he, he was at James Madison for three seasons at one point, but he's been at every other stop for two seasons or one. And he's moved up each, you know, every two, three years, he's moving up. He's a climber. He's got a good agent. He interviews well. He's got a good personality. He has, you know, he's an African-American coach. He has a lot of qualities that these colleges want. He's an excellent recruiter. UB had the number one recruiting class in the conference last year and probably will be ranked very highly again when it comes out this year. He's everything that these teams want. I do think he does need to have a really good season and a really good record and a really good, you know, championship on his resume. But as soon as that happens, I think he's going to be moving on and moving out. Um, and it might happen before that because of how I think personable he is and his agent and the way he can present himself. And I think he might never have really been in the mix to get this Cincinnati job, but I think him and his agent did a good job of getting his name out there in the mix. And, and that is a, a hint as to what we're going to see when, when maybe UB is coming off a nine win season and how many rumored jobs we hear that Mo Linguist is potentially in the mix for. The and agent is critical. We learned that. I mean, well, we didn't learn it, but we were certainly hammered uh, over the head with it with Doug Marone coming out of Syracuse. The average football fan, even at the college level, let alone the NFL, was inundated with tweets from the national reporters about this hot candidate, Doug Marone. And everybody was like, what? 
And sure enough, he was getting interviews left and right. This hot candidate. This, here's Doug Marone. Here's Doug Marone. Haven't you heard about Doug Marone? I'm like, no, I haven't heard about fucking Doug Marone. Uh, <laughs> but here he is making every goddamn interview on the and uh, and here he comes. Uh, and wow. Wow. Doug Marone. Um, so and anyway, he, with, with Nate Oates, I mean, Nate Oates deserved the, the job he got and the jobs he was talked about getting. But he also had an agent who was working to have three, four offers in his back pocket as soon as UB season was over. And that's how the game is played. Yeah. What's critical importance. The same with Lance Leipold, the average booster at, at pick any university, the average booster isn't such a football savant that they even know the name Mo linguist or Lance Leipold. You at least need to be able to show, look, this guy has, he won. You know, if you, if you, it's difficult for a lot of universities to sell the idea of we are hiring a guy from the mid American conference uh, with a losing record. That's a good point, because I think I think it's different a little bit for basketball. You know, Jonah, you brought up Nate Oates um, because of the NCAA tournament. Right. I think, you know, when you when you take to your your alumni and your donors and you go, hey, Nate Oates, it's it's more than likely somebody who had a bracket, filled out a bracket, saw Nate Oates. They don't care about records with basketball. It's tournaments. Right. And then saw how fiery was and saw how, you know. The team plays a fun brand of basketball. So yeah, that that is kind of interesting when you when you hear that and say that that it is different basketball to football. Man, you mentioned Lance Leipold. I I, I will be the first to admit he took that Kansas job, and I thought, oh man, good God, poor Lance. He's such a good guy and such a good coach. And he's won at every level: Wisconsin Whitewater, national championships. You would be there really good. He's recruiting all these guys like they're fun to watch. They're scoring 50. He's going to go to Kansas and they're going to win two games. I'm thinking, oh, oh, this is going to be terrible. He's such a good man. I don't want this to happen to him. Oh, my God. I'm like, I sent him a, a text a couple months ago. I'm like, dude, well done. I mean, <laughs> what a, I mean, right. I mean, did anybody I mean, I mean, outside of Lance Leipold, I'm not sure a lot of people thought. Maybe oh, Mrs. Leipold. Maybe. Mrs. Maybe, maybe Mrs. Maybe. Leipold. Yeah, she had doubts, I'm sure. But <laughs> I mean, but what a great that's a great story, though, because there are some programs when guys go from the Mac or you know, these these uh the mid-sized school programs to the big ones that are just kind of the bottom feeders in their conference every year, and you go, Well, that guy will be right back in the Mac in two years. We'll see him on the sideline in Akron in a couple of years. And Lance just – now it's like, when's Lance leave Kansas? You know, when is he – when's he in the Big Ten, you know, at a big school? When's he in the SEC at a big school? You know, it's just kind of – Cincinnati. Yeah. Big well, he school. Was, <laughs> he was rumored to be in the mix for Nebraska or Wisconsin. I don't know if that would have actually played out, but he was certainly mentioned as one of the names to watch for both of those jobs. All right, last Winning topic. Winning your chances will do so that, I, right? Well, I want to ask Josh something real quick. Well, and, yeah. and, and I just want to underscore his, his, his point about Lance Leipold in uh, Kansas. Turner Gill, same exact thing, came from winning at Buffalo, went to Kansas, couldn't win any games there, and it, it derailed his climb up the coaching ladder. And I thought when uh, Lance Leipold took that job, having known Turner, they coached together in uh, Nebraska, that you know I wondered why he tried to follow that same path, but he's proven that his coaching style and – you can recruit differently now with the transfer portal that he was able to break through in a way that really very few other coaches have done at that job. But I wanted to ask Josh regards to UB football, you know, where do you think this program is over the course of your seven and a half years here as a story and its relevance in the market and how often, you know, you feel like it's, you know, worth leading the sports cast and things like that. Cause it goes up and down. And I know myself, I, I'm interested in college sports and UB football, but there are times when, it seems tough to really get other people to be interested in the stories we're doing about these programs. Yeah. You know, it's, they are constantly up against the steamroller that is the NFL. I mean, it's just, it's hard to get, I mean, you look around the country just in general and you look at the cities with huge football programs, you know what they don't have NFL teams, right? Columbus, you know, they're not, it's not Cleveland. They're Buc Buckeyes all day. Ann Arbor, 
nowhere near Detroit. Well, it's near Detroit, but you know what I'm saying. Like, yep. oh, you look at well, these, Detroit doesn't have NFL okay. football yeah. either. Oh, hey, they're actually all right now. I so, think that factors it, it, it into it. That long ago. The, yeah, yeah. That's how about Miami? Okay, right. I, I think Miami, Miami and Pittsburgh are the, really the only ones. Yeah, and and Pitt sometimes is good, but still, I mean, I'm sure you could have the same discussion with put football when it comes to the Steelers, right? That we're, we're having right now as I'm sure there are a lot of pit football fans that go, man, it's just weird that the, the traction's not quite there. Well, because the Steelers run the weekend in the NFL season. Right. And then of course the hockey season starts and the penguins take up whatever's left. Uh, but it's a great point. And I mean, they've had so many really, really talented pl- just in the, Seven and a half years I've been here, they've had some super talented players who have who have been able to. Uh, now I just missed uh, I just missed Mac. I was not here for I was here for Ladarius, if that counts. For I mean he's he's he was good. He was a good college player. I think he's on a practice squad somewhere now. But um, I, they've had some. I mean Anthony Johnson was one of the funnest players I've ever covered. I mean he was just. He was fun. Tyree Jackson was fun. I mean, he was that prototypical. You're watching him and you're going, this guy's awesome for a college quarterback. Like, I don't think anybody looked at him and went, oh, no, no, no. This guy is going to be a top 10 draft pick. Now, I mean, I, I'm not sure a lot of people looked at Josh Allen and thought that either. So, but they've had some guys, man, that are just absolute, you know, fun to watch. You know, Cam Lewis has stuck around on the bills. You know, he's found a way to make a living in the NFL. So they've, they've had some talented players and they're fun. The, I'll say this. I, I think you'll, I, I think you'll agree with me. It is refreshing when we go to cover UB because they open their arms to you and they say, Hey, come on in. What story, what story would you like to work on here? At, here's a story for you. You go to the NFL you know, it's it's the other way around. You know, you got to beg, steal, and borrow to to get. You know, hey, can you think you think we can get this player or that player for two minutes for an interview? You be it's hey, as long as they're not in class, we can get you for a half an hour. You can sit down between lunch and dinner, and you know, you know their their math class in the afternoon, and you'll get interviews for an hour long. Hey, follow this guy around if you'd like for the day. Yeah. And that part of it is very refreshing. And I came from covering Penn State football, and that was the same as covering the NFL. Like it wasn't you weren't getting guys. That's that's the nice thing about you know covering you know Max football. It to, to is there a way to lead with them at, besides on a Saturday? when they're really good and maybe playing in a bowl game and stuff. I mean, it's tough because it's bills. I mean, the bills at the end of the day, you gotta, you know, that your viewer can't get enough bills, people who read and, you know, and and watch the news. They they want Thompson scored five goals last night and was the second story on the sports cast. Yes, of course. He'll be the second. Now, of course, it takes Von Miller having a season-ending injury, but still, sure. I mean, yeah. But even without pretty... that, it was a Wednesday. The Bills' story is probably, you know, leading the sportscast, leading the newspaper, regardless of what happens in the Sabres game and regardless right. of what happens at the Bills. It's it's a Bills' day. Tate Thompson could have set the NHL record, scored seven goals, and you would have had to you would have had to have waited until the sportscast. Like the A block still would have been Von Miller. I would hope that's not true, but it probably is. No, I, I would hope there'd yeah, be okay. somebody that would stand up and say, look, this doesn't happen. It uh, probably but, would have been because we would already have been out there for the A block and been like, look, we've got but the game ends mentioned. late. Yeah. The game ends late. You know, it's right up. You know, you've the, the show is I mean, set. Look, just to give you, right, I don't know. Well, that's shows, a great like, question. News producers that aren't involved in sports when Von Miller, and we already know Von Miller, we're all watching Sean McDermott, but they're all reminding us and sending us the tweets and saying, Hey, did you know this about Von Miller? That doesn't happen when Tage Thompson scores five goals. They're just saying, Hey, the sports guys have that under control. We don't have to remind everybody and emphasize how important this is. 
All right. Last question, Josh, you've been a trooper here. We've, you've stayed a long time. Awesome. No, I, I love I, it. I, it seems as though I think uh, I was able to gather that you've, you're plugged in. Uh, you were maybe running out of battery I power. Plugged and in. You're you now... saw me. I was We've seen all four, four walls. I, I did. That's I was all right. For my, you're going to great lengths power. to uh, stay with us. Um, Bennett high school, uh, Joan, I know you were at the game with uh, channel four's own Jerry Sullivan. Yep. Uh, making the drive to Syracuse. I don't know. I just want to just make sure that Bennett gets some, gets some attention here uh, for winning the state championship after a, uh, a trying season. You did predict though, that they were going to be fine uh, after the, uh, after having to forfeit all those games. Well, right. If you looked at their schedule and the way the, the number of teams in the division, you could see that those forfeits weren't going to keep them from making the section six playoffs. And then once you're in those playoffs, you just keep winning on neutral fields and, those forfeits didn't affect them other than what their final record looks like. It might have even motivated and galvanized that team in a way. And what it certainly did was, I think, get a lot of people that might not have been as interested in Bennett or high school football interested in that story and that team and fighting against the adversity that they had and the bit of a redemption story that they had. And then otherwise, it's, it's an inner city school that that school has never won a state championship. The Buffalo Public Schools have only won one state championship, South Park, back in 2015. They have, you know, three players on that team that are signed to go to Division I colleges. They have another three to four that are probably going to be Division I players eventually and probably three to four ninth graders that are Division I players down the line. And I think it's one of these teams that will look back five, ten years ago, just like Josh was saying with some of these UB teams, he'd be like, wow, that guy was on that team. They were all playing there together. And I don't know if it's the best high school football team that's ever been around in Buffalo, but it's probably going to be in the conversation of the most talented group of football players together on one public high school team, not a private school that can bring everybody together. I mean, Bennett does kind of recruit from all over the city, but that's a little bit of a different story. And I just think it's a big moment for Buffalo sports that um, hopefully people got some, you know, inspiration and entertainment out of watching that team's ride through the playoffs. Yeah. I um, thought, I, I thought having, Having grown up in Northeast Ohio and then lived in central Pennsylvania for a decade, um, covering high school football is, is a little different, right? I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. it looks different. It sounds different. It just is different. And I got here, you know, you know, almost eight years ago and I I'd go to some high school football games. And I'm like, oh, this just doesn't, it doesn't feel the same. It doesn't look the same. Doesn't sound the same. Just doesn't, it just doesn't. But but there are certain teams that come around that you see them and you go, oh, oh, that team could play in any state. Like that team could play, you know, uh, Steel High is a good example. They're, they're a team in central Pennsylvania. They're playing for a state title again this year. Um, they're just loaded. They're all, they always have a ton of kids that go to D1. And I watch Bennett and they're the same size of school as school as Bennett, right? And I look at Bennett and I go, Oh, they can play with steel high. I mean, there are certain teams. And that's why, that's why I thought the Bennett story to me personally was kind of fun to, to follow because I'm looking at those guys going, Oh, that guy's clearly a D one player. That guy's clearly a D one player. How is that not guy, not a D one player? So, you know, you start seeing talent stack up like that on, on one team and it's, it's fun to watch. And I think we got to uh, credit our friend of the show, Mookie Hawkins for coaching a lot of these guys in youth football. And he, he's very instrumental in, in the development of a lot of these city youth players that ended up at Bennett. I have to say, just as a point of reference for me, uh, the 2004-2005 NHL lockout, um, there was no Sabres uh, for me to cover. So my editor, Howard Smith, was putting me here, there, and everywhere. And the 2004 Harvard Cup, uh, I covered and one of the games I covered included a future NFL player, Mike Williams, the wide receiver at Riverside. And even with an N future NFL player on the field, it was some of the worst football I've ever seen in my life. Um, and not even in terms of the quality of play, but in the number of kids on the team, you know, you had kids who clearly were really undersized on the sideline who I'm like, that kid's not getting in the game, but he might have to get in the game. You know, it was <laughs> just like, there'd be six kids on the sideline on, and it was just, 
you know, I'm out there at all high stadium and I'm watching it. And I was like, I can't believe that this, and this is the championship. Um, you know, but it, you know, obviously there's tradition and, you know, but anyways, I, I was just struck by, I, and I, I think it was just, a a program that was in need of obvious revitalization. And they, and right about that time, some coaches got involved who were very committed to it. Jonah, you know, the names better than I do. Um, but there were some guys, there was a commitment made and I think we're start, you know, not starting to, we have seen a total overhaul of that level of, uh, of city football in Buffalo, at least compared to what I witnessed. And the difference is the Harvard Cup League was, I think, eight different schools, and maybe there weren't enough players for all of these schools. They have full teams and competitive teams, and now they're in Section 6. Bennett is a combined school that pulls players from six, six different schools, and I think there's four, if not five, city schools in Section 6. So it's they've allowed this program to thrive in a way that wouldn't have happened in the Harvard Cup. Well, boys, thanks for this. We went uh, over time. And uh, we still have to get to Florina Altschiller uh, to talk about the Matt Ariza case. So for those of you listening to the podcast, uh, thanks for enduring. Um, thank you for, for your struggle. I, I, I'm grateful that you, that you put up with this. Um, I feel like we should Josh, be playing taps in the background. <laughs> <laughs> Josh, uh, thank you for this. And uh, Jonah, you've been a trooper today also. Um, much love, much love to one and all. Uh, I'll see everybody Sunday at the game if I don't see you at the bar before then. Awesome. Thanks for having me, guys. I pr- yeah. appreciate it, as always. We had a little taste of it on Sunday there, Josh. Let me know if you're ever getting itchy to, uh, you know, you got some time. Yeah, that you know, out was at the fun. casino, Out at the casino, and yeah, we for- no gambling. We just were nope. shooting the Dang proverbial it. poop, and yep. we were enjoying ourselves, and it gets to be quite entertaining. It is fun. It is fun. You are a classic, uh, a man of drunk. the people, a man of the people. Oh, I thought you were just going to say a classic drunk <laughs> oh, man of the people. Uh, I enjoy making friends. Uh, I gen- I will generally know the bartender's name quite quickly. Uh, I, you knew the I made- math teacher sitting two stools down, Brian, the math <laughs> teacher. That's right. <laughs> right. I think you enjoy <laughs> making enemies just as much as you enjoy making friends. That's not Touché. true. That's not true. I don't, I don't enjoy making enemies, but I'm not afraid to make enemies. I think there's a big uh, difference. All right. There's a big difference. Uh, I will, as the kids say, I will quote, go there, unquote. All right. <laughs> I'll take the Josh, kids say you, that have, you have a life to live. You have children. You have a wife. <laughs> Unlike Jonah, who can do this all day. Uh, Jonah has neither. Or Thank life. you for this. Uh, and now, now a quick word from our sponsor and then back with Farina Altschiller on the Matt Ariza case. CTBK is more than just a full service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem solving skills. CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara communities through volunteer work and donations and has partnered up with Victory Sports for 2022 to help keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed. Whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400 and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you. We're joined now on the podcast by Florina Altschiller. She is a former prosecutor, current defense attorney. Uh, In fact, she was a former prosecutor in the sex crimes division for the state of Alaska. She is now an attorney here based uh, in Western New York for Russo and Gould. And uh, Florina, we we had you on a few months back to talk about the Matt Ariza case. And the most educational conversation uh, that I'd seen uh, about it uh, was uh, was your thoughts on it, or, or I had read, or any in my research, because you provided a lot of counterbalance. I think there's a lot of rush one way or the other to either defend the football player uh, because we need him on our team uh, was what I was hearing a lot of, or the initial. Uh, because of the heinous accusations, there's, I think, a tendency from people to just automatically believe it. 
uh, and it was a great conversation. So that's why I wanted to have you back. Thanks for doing it. Yeah, thanks for having me back. Um, Florina, what did we learn yesterday from the statements that were released by the San Diego County District Attorney's Office, from Matt Arise's attorney, from the accuser's attorney? I guess if we put it all together, did we learn anything significantly uh, uh, instrumental to this case? Law enforcement in conjunction with the local district attorney's office out of San Diego did a multi-month investigation. They obviously looked into the allegations. They listened to whatever statements were made. They watched whatever video was available from the party. Um, They've interviewed everyone who attended that party, everyone that would speak with them. And as a result of that pretty lengthy, thorough investigation, they made a determination that based on the available evidence, there is not sufficient evidence to prove to the standard necessary, which is a beyond a reasonable doubt standard, which is not, you know, more likely than not, or probably or a civil standard by a preponderance of the evidence. This is a criminal case, so it's beyond a reasonable doubt. And they made a determination that to that legal standard, there's not enough evidence to support those charges. And they did the right thing. They declined to prosecute. Now, when you see those statements, uh, you can, it's like a Rorschach test. You can read into it kind of whatever you want when when the district attorney's office gives this comment. I'll just go ahead and read it here for the record uh, for those who maybe are just following this on a cursory basis. Uh, What the San Diego County uh, district attorney's office said was ultimately prosecutors determine it is clear the evidence does not support the filing of criminal charges and there is no path to a potential criminal conviction. Prosecutors can only file charges when they ethically believe they can be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, a lot of people read that and said he's innocent. Uh, Other people read that and said, um, you know, high priced attorney uh, got the football player off. Uh, There's all kinds of ways you can read that. And I think that the district attorney's ambiguous on purpose, um, I guess, is that what's the. We're supposed to be neutral, I guess, as we read this, but it's hard not to be. Uh, it's hard not to be invested one way or the other when you're dealing with um, charges that are very emotional and have a lot of uh, uh, people have an opinion on these. So I guess what's your uh, your what would be your advice on digesting what we learned yesterday from all the 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 attorneys? I think the statement from the district attorney's office is unequivocally clear, and it clearly says that there's not enough evidence to prosecute. I think the question people are trying to answer is, look, did he have group sex with this underage girl? And that's not the question that the district attorney's office was trying to answer. The question the DA's office was trying to answer is, did he commit a crime? And I think for most people, those two things are at odds with each other, right? If he had group sex with an underage girl, that should be a crime. But the truth of the matter is, it may well not be. Um, For example, in this case, she represented herself on video as being of age. And remember, we're in the state of California, not New York. In New York, you have sex with someone underage. That's it. It's a crime. In California, you have sex with someone underage, but they represented to you that they are of age. That is a complete defense in California. And there was evidence in this case on video of her at the party telling people that she's older than she is and that she's a college student. And it appears that the people who had sex with her reasonably relied on that statement. And in California, that's a defense. Whether you like it or not, that's the law. And it's the prosecutor's job to follow the law. And when a defense is available, they ethically cannot press charges and push forward with the case. So that's one issue. The other issue is the group sex, right? That doesn't sit well with some people, especially when we're talking about young people. We're talking about a football player and a 16-year-old. That just does not sound good. It sounds unethical. It sounds immoral. Um, that's not the question that's presented Seven, to 17, the right? Just so people, she was uh, 17 at the time. She turned of the- 17. 
very closely, I believe, yeah. after the fact. Um, but, you know, these are young people. Um, and the idea is, what young person would would consent to this? Well, there's there's people who would, um, and it's not really the law's job to judge morality. It's the law's job to judge the elements versus the facts. And so, if the facts support a violation of the law, based on the law as currently written, not based on what we might want it to be, then the person can be prosecuted. If the facts do not match those necessary elements, then there is no crime. You know, I think a great example would be marijuana. We lived in a society where possession of marijuana was illegal and people would get prosecuted for simply having marijuana, whether or not people agreed with that. Now we live in a society where having marijuana is legal in most states. And now people are no longer prosecuted for that. And there's people on both ends agreeing or disagreeing about whether that should or should not be a crime. But the law is the law. And in this case, the DA's office did the right thing. They followed the law in a case that sounds perhaps unethical, morally reprehensible, crazy, inappropriate. But that is not the question that the DA's office has to decide. What about the element of intoxication and consent in that regard? Yeah, so it is so, so difficult to prove that somebody was intoxicated to the point where they're not capable of consent. Mere intoxication would make the vast majority of Americans criminals here. Most people who have sexual interactions with one another have something to drink. That is not a crime. You have one drink, you have three drinks, you have five drinks. The question is whether you are intoxicated to the point where you are incapacitated. And the two cannot be true here, right? She's saying that she knows who did this, she knows what they did, she knows how they did it, and she knows exactly who did what in what order. So she's clearly not drunk to the point of incapacitation. And the there's class- a different there's a different threshold, for instance, of driving while intoxicated versus intoxicated for the sake of consent, because it's not, you know, people think that at 0.8 or 0.08 or whatever, there's thinking clearly versus uh, passed out or even, or, you know, uh, you don't even have to be unconscious, but severely, severely incapacitated. I mean, I guess what's the standard there for, for that? Great, great, great point, Tim. Um, for drunk driving, it's a blood alcohol level. You could do a breathalyzer, you could get a blood drop. It's a bright line. If your blood alcohol level is below the legal limit, you're good. If it's above the legal limit, you're not good. There is no test specifically for sex crimes by intoxication. Uh, You have to be incapacitated, not capable of consent. The classic example is somebody who is passed out drunk. A perpetrator sees this person unconscious and they're like, oh, great we're going to have sex with her. That would be rape by incapacitation. Somebody who's simply drinking, if they're having a conversation, if they're still coherent, they're capable of consent. Mere drinking in and of itself does not mean that the person's being taken advantage of. And in this case, there's video of her at the party, having conversations with people, appearing to be you know, close to sober. And I say close to sober because I'm certainly not taking the position that she had nothing to drink. But that's not the standard. It's not someone had a couple of drinks. You can't have sex with him. Uh, everyone would be in jail in America. Husbands and wives. <laughs> the the entire country. Anybody who's met at a bar and, you know, had a couple of drinks on a date, you would you would be able to say, you know, didn't couldn't consent. Right. I mean, if we take it to an extreme, but I guess you can't, maybe it's not even an extreme that that's, I guess it's a real world example of, of, uh, of the line that needs to be considered. And I think that, you know, a, a lot of my motivation in having this discussion, Florina is because everybody wants to armchair quarterback the legal process and how a district attorney's office thinks how a defense attorney is supposed to think how the accuser's attorney is supposed to act 
Uh, and every, because it involves the National Football League and a player on your favorite team, it's easy just to jump in and out of the conversation without fully trying to comprehend really how, how it works. Jonah, yeah, I know I, you had a question there. Well, I did want to ask, but I wanted to wait until you guys kind of went through all the legal ramifications, but I wanted to ask Florina, and maybe this is outside of your expertise in the legal realm, but for those of us in the court of public opinion, I mean, do the facts of the case that we know vindicate Matareza in any way, and by extension, the bills and how they handled this case and how they learned information and how they reacted to it over the summer? Yeah, there are people who think that the bills are are now um, liable for damages uh, because they cut an innocent man. That is absolutely not true. Um, I could not disagree with that more. Uh, the standard for cutting him from the team is not whether or not he committed a crime. The standard for cutting him from the team, um, based on his contract, is whether or not a lawsuit is pending up against him. The mere fact that a lawsuit was filed against him, and remember, there is still a civil lawsuit pending against him. Once that civil lawsuit was filed by that alleged victim against him, that right there, whether he did it or not, the mere filing of that lawsuit was enough for the bills to say, this is a distraction to him and a distraction to the team. And we're going to terminate his contract because he is involved in an active lawsuit, not because he raped somebody, not because there's criminal charges coming or filed, but because there is a lawsuit against him. And so the bills acted absolutely appropriately by cutting him. Is it unfortunate? Yeah, this kid got screwed over. But that does not mean that the bills violated their contract or violated any duty to him. They had no choice but to cut him because of the filing of that lawsuit, which is still, by the way, pending. Uh, and this goes to Jonah's question. Let me read the statement that was posted on social media uh, from Ariza's agency, but it was uh, the quote was attributed uh, as being from Matt Ariza. And it reads, I am grateful that the district attorney and the San Diego Police Department have discovered all the facts and found no criminal wrongdoing. I am excited to continue my NFL career. That's not true. It's not that they found no criminal wrongdoing. And I don't want to load up the question here, Florina, but what do you think about how accurate his statement is that the police and the district attorney found no criminal wrongdoing? Well, I mean, technically, they found not enough evidence to support criminal wrongdoing. It is impossible to find somebody innocent. That's never going to happen. That's why defense attorneys don't have a burden of proof. We can't prove that somebody didn't do it. That's proving the impossible. So the only thing that can be proven is that somebody affirmatively did do it. And here, what the DA and law enforcement are saying is we can't meet that standard. We cannot prove that he did do it. It doesn't mean that he's innocent, but it does mean that there's not enough evidence to prove that he did. And to be fair, when law enforcement says we can't prove that somebody did it, that does mean that they didn't do it. It means that they're innocent. Look, maybe they're innocent like O.J. Simpson was innocent, right? The world knows he killed Nicole Brown Simpson, but a jury found him not guilty. And once that happens, he didn't do it. Here, the DA's office affirmatively said we don't have enough evidence. The case is not even going forward. And so it's really not for us to guess that he did or didn't do it. That's it. Uh, he's not going to be held criminally responsible. And we should respect the legal system and respect that decision and not sit back and say he probably did it. Is it normal that this took over a full year to for the DA to determine that there was not enough evidence and, and should the bills have been able to get a clearer picture of the case in the summer when they were looking into it? Again, I think for the bill's involvement, the civil lawsuit is what did it, the filing of that civil lawsuit. And so whether or not there's a criminal case is wholly irrelevant. It's a total red herring for the bill's involvement. Now, is it normal for law enforcement and the DA's office to investigate this case for as long as they did? 
I would say that's pretty exceptional. Um, when I was in a sex crimes unit, there would be times where a case would take maybe a couple of months to look into, um, but not as long as this. And I would say the reason it's exceptional here and the reason I suspect it took as long as it did is one, because there were quite a few people at that party. And my best guess is that they wanted to interview anyone and everyone that was there. They wanted to get any and all video photos, anything on people's cell phones, and it takes time. People aren't lining up at their door to hand things over. People don't respond to calls. People don't cooperate. It takes time to get this evidence, to interview people, to collect what they have, perhaps get phone records from the phone carriers. These things don't just get turned over immediately. So that's part one. Part two, I suspect part of what was going on behind the scenes is we're talking about somebody who plays for the NFL or played, right? And something that's getting national media focus and attention. And so they want to get it right. They don't want to just dump this case and be criticized afterwards. And they also don't want to pursue this case and have it be like a Duke lacrosse situation where it turns out that those players were legitimately innocent and they were prosecuted. So I applaud the San Diego DA's office for taking the time necessary to get it right and to come to what really is, in my opinion, a just conclusion and resolution here. What about the civil case? Uh, based on what we do know, and we do know an awful lot because uh, both sides have shared information that has uh, that would help them in the court of public opinion. Uh, so we've the, the videos have been leaked, photographs of uh, how she looked afterwards in terms of the bruising and um, her statements, her journal. Um, what about the civil case? And can you, I don't want you to predict, but if you could maybe lay out uh, what Matt Ariza has to deal with moving forward in that regard. So this civil case, as all civil cases are, um, is about money. She wants to get paid money. Does that suggest that she is exaggerating or lying? Perhaps money is a great motivating factor to come up with an exaggerated story. Um, or she could be telling the truth, but there is no doubt that what she wants is money. And the good news for her is- But let me state arena, this just for the, because that, because I know how people interpret information as it's coming in. When you say it that way, that makes it that people, a lot of people think money grabbing, uh, gold digger. But as her, as, as the accuser's attorney has said, money, yes, yeah, she is after money because that's the only way we can get justice is because if, if not for the, this, you know, his statements uh, yesterday, uh, you know, it's very rare for these cases to actually go to trial. Uh, this is our only way to get justice and to make him pay is that's through their position. Yeah, uh, I, I, I don't agree with that position. Money is okay. not the only way um, she could have sought an apology. She could have sought all sorts of non monetary um, remedies. And, you know, you want justice. The criminal justice system is a way to get justice. But the district attorney's office has made a determination that a crime did not occur here. Um, and there are plenty of crimes that are prosecuted. Sex crimes units and district attorney's office across the country are overwhelmed by the number of cases that they are bringing forward. I don't think this is some sort of conspiracy where that DA's office decided to kibosh this case because they're in cahoots with Matt Ariza. The fact right. is there was not enough evidence to support a criminal case. She's not seeking justice. She's seeking money. Is money the fair means of compensating somebody who's been injured? Of course it is. If they were in fact wrongfully, um, wrongly treated, injured, if there's damages, that is the, the only compensation available in a civil lawsuit. Yes. But make no mistake about it. That is the goal here is to be paid for an alleged wrong that occurred. The good news for her and her attorney is the road to getting paid is easier than in the criminal justice system. First of all, criminal justice system does not pay. The only possible outcome is the possibility of jail for the defendant. 
civil system, the possible outcome is the person who's doing the suing to get paid some amount of damages. And a jury would determine that or a settlement would be reached. But in a civil lawsuit, she only needs to prove that this happened by a preponderance of the evidence. In other words, more likely than not. It's no longer a reasonable doubt standard like it is in a criminal case. So it's going to be much easier for her to prevail. Again, think of the OJ Simpson case. He's found not guilty criminally. Nicole Brown Simpson's family sues civilly and a jury says he's responsible for that wrongful death. So you could have a situation where someone succeeds civilly even though there's no criminal case. A quick point and a question. I know we have to wrap up. I think that part of the reason people think of, uh, well, there's a lot of reasons people think of corrupt district attorney's offices. And it's because we see all, you know, it's on television all the time. It's it's uh, CSI and it's law and order and whatever. And, and it's whatever case that you see coming out of uh, the news of the day here and there. So people just have this distrust of, of attorneys, which goes back centuries. Um, but uh, I think that the, the, not necessarily the corruption, but the, there's a PR element too, from the college's standpoint, San Diego State and its handling of it, much more image conscious when you're talking about campus police dealing with children. We, we want you to trust us to send your children to our university, et cetera, et cetera. I think that there's this, this stigma that, that campus police have in terms of how they handle an issue. But, uh, it, and I know that quickly, I know you're, you're up against it here, Florina. We ha I have a contract that has moral turpitude clause in it. You probably have a contract that has a moral turpitude clause in it. I don't know if Jonah has a contract, uh, but that is a weird phrase that people hear it and they think, well, that's a legal thing, but it kind of, I just wanted to ask, can you describe what moral turpitude is and what the burden is for an employer to say, uh, you turpituted us. <laughs> well, completely different standard there altogether, too. Um, but it, it lends itself to the question earlier about what the bills were able to do in terms of a contract and say, yeah. look, we just don't want to deal with this. I think I think that the bills don't even need to go there in this case. Um, I think for sure the moral turpitude clause would apply um, just for having sex with someone underage in, you know, a group sex situation at a party. Um, certainly that does not sound um, nice to put it mildly, right? But I don't know that the bills need to even use that clause or go there because his clause also specifically says that if he is sued or actively involved in litigation, then that would be a reason to let him go. And the minute the civil lawsuit was filed against him, they can release them, which is what they did. And that's really black and white. Either a lawsuit is or is not filed. We don't need to even get into a question of fact of whether or not what he did is uh, of poor moral uh, character or not. I think that gets very gray and icky um, and it could go either way. Uh, there's certainly people that'll take sides on that one, but there is no taking sides on whether or not a lawsuit was filed. That's clear. It's cut and dry. They filed a lawsuit against him. That right there allowed the bills to release him. And we don't even need to get into the facts of the alleged rape. Yeah. Well, Florina, thanks for summing this up for us in such a clear and emphatic way, uh, definitive. And I also want to thank you for uh, joining us today from the art gallery. Uh, you've classed <laughs> up the joint uh, quite a bit with your presence and also with where you're, where you're, uh, joining us from. it's uh, This has been a delight. Thanks so much for having me. Happy to be back. Love discussing this case. Well, let's make sure we do it again. Sure. Florina Altschilder from Russo and Gould, former prosecutor in the sex division for the state of Alaska, uh, now uh, a defense attorney uh, practicing here in Buffalo. Uh, we'll talk again soon. Oh,